what we have here now is the moguls and what i want to do first is i want to start in the year 1398 much before the time and you will see why very quickly uh, 1526 is when the Mughal Empire is set to begin, but I hear, begin with the year 1398, the year that Timur terrorized Delhi. So who was Timur? Uh, his name has come down in history as one of the more feared, one of the more ferocious conquerors of world history, along with Genghis Khan, uh, for example. Uh, so he, you know, I, I, and remember that the Mongols are these kind of nomadic tribes that, uh, and under Genghis Khan, they basically, uh, you know, uh, spread out uh, and conquer vast terrains of territory. Uh, so he, so, you know, and the Mongols are, were, you, you, you may remember, they were a threat to India, uh, to Alauddin Khilji, who pushed them back many times very successfully. Now there is a Mongol army under Tamerlane, uh, also known as Timur the Lame, because he had a limp. So that's why he's called Timur the Lame, is going to attack India and enter Delhi in December 1398. Uh, in the year 1398, circa 1400, India's, North India is still under the Delhi Sultanate. And uh, the problem here was that at this point in time, the Delhi Sultanate was in a rather bad shape. Uh, the uh, one of the uh, one of the uh, uh, sultans there, Ferosha uh, Tughluq, uh, he had he had died about ten years before 1398, so about 1298, and after that, the succession is disputed, right? Um, all of those details are less important than what happens now from the point of view of this lecture, right? Th that is that because there is, a, there is no strong central administrative authority, the, dis the succession is disputed. You have two different people who are pretenders to the throne. Uh, and so you have Delhi under the control of a man called Mallu Khan and another man by the name of Mahmud Shah. Uh, th they realize the threat that Timur poses. And they're going to put forward an, an army of 10,000 horses, 40,000 infantrymen, and uh, over 100 elephants. And it's very important to remember that in those times, the elephant, as it had been during the time of Alexander the Great, because elephants were always part of Indian armies. Don't forget that. Right? The elephant was a dreaded animal. I was dreaded an animal because it's a huge beast and it can trample over people, okay? And then of course, if you're seated on top of uh, an elephant in a howdah, you're at a much greater elevation than the soldier on the ground, you're much greater elevation. So, you know, you can command the, the forces more effectively from there and you can terrorize uh, people by being on an elephant. Uh, and the 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 Indians uh, had, you know, the, um, at this time the army that was put forward when Timur comes into Delhi, uh, uh, they had, as I said, over a hundred war elephants. So so one of the things that Timur now, you know, Timur comes from a long line of warriors and conquerors. That's what their profession is. That's what they've been doing for long time. I mean, he's the ancestor of the, the great Genghis Khan and people like that. Uh, they, they, they had developed a whole repertoire of skills to deal with situations of this kind. So one of the ways, by the way, in which, I mean, it's enormously interesting in itself, one of the ways in which um, they tried to neutralize uh, elephants um, was that they would, they would tie large stacks of dried grass, long grass, they would tie it to the back and to the tail of camels and, and they would get as close to the elephants as they reasonably could. And then what they would do is they would, they would light these 
uh, large stacks of, as I said, dried grass, which had been tied to elephants, I mean, to, to camels, they would let, they would then light them and then they would let these camels loose. So these camels were, would be terrified because they've got, you know, the back of there, they can sense the heat, they, it's burning and they would just let go let loose, right? And, and the whole idea was to create chaos now, because when 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 uh, a chaos is created, elephants actually get unnerved. That's what that's one of the things that these Mongols had learned. That's how you deal with an opposing army that has elephants. Okay, and when you start uh, getting the elephants in a panic, very often they will attack their own people. They will turn back on their own people because everything at that point is going haywire. So, long story short. A big army is put forward. Timur crushes this army. And because he's lost a good number of his own men too in this long fight, when he gets into Delhi, he is going to initiate a massacre. All right, so 1398, this is, it's in all kinds of history books. You know, he basically lays the city to waste. And to lay the city to waste means you kill virtually particularly men, okay? Men would be killed. Women are very often raped or they're taken into slavery. Um, uh, here, we don't have much evidence that a large number of women would have been taken into slavery because when you take them into slavery, then one problem is you have to take them back with you. And that means that your army becomes vulnerable when you're going back, when you're, you're fighting people along the way, going back, right? But anyhow, he, he so he, it's what's very clear is that he takes whatever booty he can find. He lays waste to the city, kills, you know, uh, I mean, apparently over 150, 200,000 men, which at that point in time would have been a massive proportion of the population. I mean, some of the sources say that that you know not a sound was heard from Delhi for days after Timur left. I mean, you couldn't even hear a bird. They, it was absolutely still. The city was completely lifeless. Uh, on the way back, he lays waste to Lahore because now you're going much further west. And remember, these distances at that time mean something a lot more than they mean now, right? You're moving with large army. You know, you have to stop after 15 miles. You you know, set up camp for the night. Then you've got to. Uh, you, people forget that, right? You you have to set up camp, and then you have to. Uh, in the morning, you have to, you know, put everything back together, uh, uh, you know, because at, at night when they set up camp, and this is going to be true of the Mughal armies centuries later, same thing. You know, they're cooks, they have to cook food for all the soldiers, all of that, you know, you've got, you've got pots, uh, food, provisions, supplies. So it takes time. It takes time. And sometimes I've been asked by students, why did it take so long? To get to Lahore from Delhi, right? I mean, it's not that far. Uh, you know, uh, how many kilometers is it? Maybe 300 kilometers. Why should it take a month or month and a half? Well, that's one reason why it takes that long. He gets there, he lays waste to the city, and then he's going to move further west back into his capital. Now, why is this important? We'll have to, so I'm really setting up the backdrop which many histories of the Mughals don't do, some of the more interesting ones do. And it's very important to do that because we have to understand their sensibility. Who are these people? Because the Mughal empire was perhaps the greatest empire in the world in its time, all right? I think many historians would agree with that assessment. So who are these people? How do they create that empire? What does it mean? to have created that empire? Where do they come from? Babur's on his father's side is descended from Timur, on his mother's side from Genghis Khan. Now here there's a very complicated history which we don't need to get into, but I only alert you to one small element of it because if you ever get interested, you start reading books, you say to yourself after a while, I'm getting really confused. Are these people Mongols or are they Turks? What are they? Well, the Mongols and the Turks, you know, it's not always possible to make a distinction, okay? Um, where one begins, where the other ends, who these, you know, whether they're distinct groups or not. Because really, I mean, I'm saying he's descended, Babur, who said, creates the empire, 1526, 
He is descended from Timur. And I also said that Timur's own ancestors go back to Genghis Khan. And then I'm saying on the other hand that Babur on his mother's side is descended from Genghis Khan. So, you know, what exactly are, how far are the father's lines and the mother lines, are they that different? And I'm saying we can't be absolutely certain, all right? But important thing here is it gives you a sense of the ancestry. The ancestry is not just people who are warlike. That's the more important thing. This is why we need to understand what the culture was of people like Timur, because that's a culture that Babur inherits before he comes to India. That's the crucial thing, all right? So Timur establishes the Timur Empire, which lasts from 1307 to um, 1507, I don't know, I, I put 1405 accidentally here, it's 1507, okay? Uh, I, 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 excuse me, 1370 to 1507, that's the right date, okay? It's initially based in Samarkand, and I'll show you some maps here in, in a moment, from 1370 to 1405, and then Herat from 1405 to 1507, all right? And Babur comes from a tribe known as the Barlas Turks. These are people who are actually Mongols who had adopted Turki, which is the language of the Mughal family. Many people say the language of the Mughal family was Persian. Well, that's the Persian is the official language of the Mughal court in India. Um, but the Mughals themselves also had a language which is known as Turki, which is now a language that no longer exists. It's extinct. Okay, this language is also known, AKA, also known as Chagatai. And in fact, the Babur Nama, which is Babur's autobiography. Okay, Babur Nama is the Chronicles of Babur written by himself. All right, it is actually written in this language called Turki. And there are some resemblances to languages such as Turkish and so on. All right. So to give you an idea of this area first, and then we go back to that. So this is the Chagatai Khanate from the word Khan or the Tem over here on the north here. And this is the Temurid Empire. The Amudarya, this river here, this is also known as the River Oxus. That's the other name by which it's known. And, and when you're looking at this uh, river here, um, very often when we say Transoxania, that is that beyond the river Oxus, okay? To the other side of the river. That's what it means when you encounter the phrase Transoxania. All right. So um, I'm just looking for, uh, give me a second, looking for a sheet here, which had some notes, additional notes, which I seem to have kind of uh, misplaced. I'll probably find it here. Well, okay, it doesn't really matter because I, I know enough from here that. So uh, here is, um, I just wanna show you a couple of the more important places. Okay, so let's let's begin here. We're just gonna look at some of them. This is Baghdad over here, where you see the cursor, extreme left here. Okay, so Baghdad is modern day Iraq, right? And then Isfahan and Shiraz, as you probably know, are two of uh, the more famous cities um, in Iran. Uh, so the Timurid Empire, the empire that is established by Timur, the same person who destroyed Delhi, and this is Delhi over here, all the way to the east here, you can see, and here's the Delhi Sultanate, all right? Uh, and uh, uh, this entire area was under the jurisdiction of uh, Timur. Uh, here's Herat, and here's Samarkand over here. Tashkent over here, north, you might not remember this, uh, but I would remember it. But in, 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 um, in the memory of an Indian of my generation, the name is etched forever because the second prime minister of India, who only was prime minister for a very short period of time, Lal Bahadur Shastri, after the death of Jawaharlal Nehru, he had gone to Tashkent for a uh, conference uh, for, and he died of a heart attack there. So we always learned it, uh, you know, as part of general knowledge. Uh, so re little realizing really what it meant, because these are all cities with long history. Bukhara over here, um, famous uh, uh, restaurant in Delhi, 
uh, at the Moria Hotel called the the Bukhara restaurant, extremely famous. One of my favorites. One of my favorites. I'm actually ordering from the sister restaurant for dinner today. Okay. <laughs> All right. So there's Bukhara. Now you know where Bukhara is. All right. Yeah. Okay. So this is Samarkand here. And uh, Samarkand was where Timur's empire was based. But this was a very important city too. Herat, we'll see, we'll talk about that in a few moments. Mar Kabul. That's a modern day, where is all this? Tashkent, Bukhara, Samarkand, where is that? You mean what what states do they belong to now? Is that That's, what you're asking? Yeah. Oh yeah, I'll get to that in a second. I'll show you another map and then you'll see what states they belong to at the moment, which countries they belong to at the moment, right? You'll see that in a moment. But at that point, it was all part of the Timurid Empire. And, and here you have Kandahar. Kandahar is Afghanistan, okay? And Kabul as well. So here's another map here. So now here you see, right? So this is the same extent of the empire over that you saw, saw in the previous one, but Notice that now these are the modern states. These were, these were all, this is all Central Asia over here. So you're talking about Kabul is over here, Samarkand is over here, okay? And when, I, when I'm going to talk about the Uzbeks in a couple of minutes, I'm talking about people who are coming from now this state called Uzbekistan. These are all separate countries now. They're all separate countries now, but, but they were all part of USSR in the 20th century, Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, remember? And then it was only with the breakup of the Soviet Union that they all became. But before that, they were all part of different political entities. Uh, and, uh, and so this is Iran and you know, you've know you got is, uh, Isfahan here and Shiraz over here where my cursor is, right? Uh, and yet here yet is a third map just again, so that you get a very good sense of what we're really talking about. So modern day Tashkent here, okay, um, which I've talked about, Bukhara, uh, and this gives you the Timurid Empire over here. This is, a, this is when it had actually become smaller. And here you see the Delhi Sultanate. You notice the Delhi Sultanate extending all the way um, into what is obviously modern day Pakistan, all of that as well, right? And then Kabul here in Afghanistan, Ghazni, you're familiar to you now, and Herat. So these are some of the places to keep in mind. Now, let's go back to this. So Babur is born on 14 February 18, 1483. His father is ruler of Fergana, which is a small province to the east of Samarkand. And I think on one of these maps here, you will see Fergana. Um, at least I... But okay, it's not shown here, but Fergana would be around here. So east, this is Samarkand. So around here, it's to the east of that. It's a small kind of little kingdom. Uh, and Babur's father is uh, ruling over this area. It's, it's not a major place as such. All right. <coughs> um, it, uh, Babur loses his father when he's 11 years old. And this meant that he basically had to stand on his own feet begin to look after, look out for himself. What it meant for the progeny of an emperor to look out for himself very simply meant this, it was competition. Uh, there were other people in the royal family um, uh, who were uh, looking out for getting power. Uh, there are succession battles very often, right? Uh, this is one reason why <coughs> in many uh, cultures, political cultures, they have these laws of succession. You pass it down to the oldest son, uh, and hopefully people will observe that. But you know, very often this was going to be contested. Right? Now, the Timurid Empire, the heart of that was this initially Samarkand, uh, and then uh, Herat over here, uh, and Kabul later on is going to be important. Kandahar is going to be important. We're talking roughly about this area over here. This is really the, the heart of it, okay? Bukhara as well. These were walled cities. They were walled cities. I haven't shown you any slides because it'll take a lot of time if we start to get into their, their own culture. Remember, our purpose here is to try to get some sense of who Babur was, enter into his mind. Because when, for example, we look at the Mughal period in India, one of its 
greatest accomplishments in a way, or one of the things that has survived is the whole tradition of miniature painting. Well, where did this tradition of miniature painting come from? Right? It, it's, there's no tradition of miniature painting in India really before the Timurids, that is before Babur. It, it really comes, and, and so therefore we have to have some sense of what this tradition was there. One of the other things that the Mughals are known for, um, if you go to Kashmir, you know, it's famous for its gardens. Well, all of these gardens were set up by the Mughals, right? And the, the, the Timurids, we might think of Timur himself as this kind of ferocious, feared warrior who laid waste to Delhi and um, uh, Lahore and a number of other places, right? Just like Ghazni did, right? Ghazni came and looted. We looked at that in great detail, but but he set up a court, and it was it was a court where he brought the greatest intellectuals of the day. Now the Timurids, that is Timur and his and his uh, and his descendants, people from his family, and then the grandchildren, and you know the next generations. They had this love of poetry, painting, architecture, but architecture in a different way because. They didn't bring build grand palaces. One of the reasons they didn't build grand palaces is because this is really a warrior nomadic culture at the same time. So they were accustomed to going from place to place and they would very often settle down in a place for a few years or a few nights and they would put up these huge tents. These were like pavilions, right? You know, a palace is fixes you, right? You're, you're fixed to the property then. And, and you know, the, you, you know, I'm sure you know that, you know, the, the, uh, uh, there is a great tradition of carpets. Uh, I mean, of course, India has it too, particularly Kashmir, no surprise, but, but you get this great tradition of Persian carpets, carpets from Central Asia. And these carpets were very often rolled and they were carried along by the army. So when they set up the tent uh, for, the, for the emperor or the ruler, uh, they would lay out these carpets because th these are, this is movable property, all right? So th these, uh, uh, in this Timurut culture, there is this enormous fascination for poetry, painting, gardens, and all of that. Now, political story, very short. We're gonna end in about 10 minutes. I'm gonna show you some slides. So let me just give you a, I want to fill up this picture because then that will take us into the Mughals per se, right? Um, so Babur is based in Fergana uh, uh, initially. Uh, Fer Fergana is where his father uh, had been ruling. But, you know, by his time, Fergana was, I mean, even in his father's time, it was not that major place. But, uh, but by, his, uh, by Babur's own time, uh, which is now we're talking about, you know, lit, you know, literally like 80, 90 years, a century after uh, Timur. Uh, by his time, the other cities had become far more important, as I've already indicated, Samarkand, Herat, Bukhara, uh, and even Kabul, okay? Uh, so he is going to, because Fergana is a very small base, if he wants to really lay a claim to becoming a great ruler, he first has to acquire the territory. So, so between 1496 and you know the early 1500s, he, he he's going to lay claim to Samarkand on a number of occasions, uh, and Samarkand is going to come into his hands. Is going to slip out. It's a long story, not necessary for us to enter into the details. The gist of it is that around 1504, 1505, he moves to Kabul which had been vacated. That is that there had been a succession dispute there. He uses that opportunity to make a claim himself and is able to establish himself. Kabul was a very cosmopolitan city, very cosmopolitan city. I don't know if there were that many cosmopolitan cities in the world as certainly not as cosmopolitan as Kabul. I, it sounds unbelievable to people today because today the impression of Afghanistan is of a place that's 
you know, savage, barbaric. That's how the West has tried to present it, right? A home to the Taliban and this and that. But it was a very cosmopolitan place. Uh, uh, Babur suggests in the Babur Nama that you could hear 15 languages being spoken there. Uh, Turkey, Hindi, Arabic, Persian, even Hindi, because Hindi had come. So Hindi is coming from the East. Uh, Persian is coming from the West, Persian and Arabic. And there would have been a number of other languages as well. All right. Um, so he establishes himself in Kabul. The other great city is Herat. This is Herat over here. And here's Kabul. So Herat is to a little bit to the West. All right. Which Timur's oldest son, Shah Rukh, right, as in our actor Shah Rukh Khan, had built into an artistic capital with the presence of an artist by the name of Kamal Uddin Bezad. Kamal Uddin Bezad is born in Herat and dies in Herat. He lives from 1455 to 1535. This man, this artist is the king of Persian miniature painting. You have to look at his works. I'm going to show you five slides to see the extraordinary complexity, sophistication, and beauty of this work. A lot of those miniature paintings have survived. Most of them are in the national collections in Iran today. So here is a, can you see that very clearly on your screen as well? You should be able to, right? Um, and when you, when you uh, look at it on a full screen. Uh, so this is the battleground of uh, Timur uh, and uh, uh, in battle with an Egyptian king. Uh, because in Egypt, you had a dynasty, a slave dynasty called the Mamluks. And of course, uh, you know, people like, people like Timur are not only going eastward into Hindustan, into India. Hindustan is really the word we should be using there, but they're also going westward, right? There's a whole idea of expanding the empire as much as they can. And this miniature there shows uh, battle scenes there. Uh, th this is a miniature painting which shows a scene from hunting. Uh, you know, you're going to find this in Mughal miniature paintings later on, this kind of uh, uh, floral patterns over here, a design and then the painting and a border, very often done with gold paint over here beautifully finely done figures, extre extremely uh, fine uh, painting. Uh, you know, the umbrella over here would always signify a person of royalty, right? Uh, uh, here is another painting. Look at the, look at the, he even uh, has a slightly different design over here because he's got a tree here in the painting here. And so he's taken it out of the frame and the tree is soaring. Uh, as it were. Um, and this is a miniature painting done by him. This is done in 1486. We have the exact date, uh, which shows a funeral of an elderly person after he was killed by a Mongol invader. Uh, if once you look at Indian miniature paintings from the Mughal period, then you realize where this um, inheritance is from. Of course, one of the things that's going to happen is a miniature painting in India moving into the 17th century, 18th century, 19th century will then take up Indian themes as well. So the so we saw some miniature, pa pa painting, miniature paintings, uh, as you may recall, when we had a long, long discussion on the Mahabharata where I'd shown you uh, miniature paintings that were done showing scenes from the Mahabharata. Uh, and it is very important to remember that the Mughal courts uh, uh, would very often authorize miniature paintings showing scenes from Indian epics, such as the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. All right. And here is um, a miniature painting. This is all by Bezad, all of these paintings. And we're talking about paintings that are done before the establishment of the Mughal Empire. Why are we seeing them once again? Because this shows you the cultural milieu from which Babur came, a cultural milieu where painting, poetry, the gardens, taking pleasure in the garden, paintings, manuscripts. Babur writes his own autobiography after all, right? Uh, I don't read obviously um, the, the, uh, the Turki Chagatai uh, language in which it is written, but 
but the text is available in very good translations. And it's really an extraordinary work, um, which we'll get to uh, in the next uh, uh, lecture, right? And here is a last illustration of this uh, painting. So, you know, we'd have to, if you study it, you know, because this shows uh, the artist's comprehension of things like perspective, how he's showing uh, a house, how he's showing different layers, levels of the house, right? Um, th that's why I'm showing you these, uh, not because they are intrinsically a history of the Mughal Empire, but because it gives you a very good uh, a sense of um, what was the ancestry of somebody like Babur. So to conclude this discussion very briefly, because I'm going to stop at the point at which he is going to come into India, right? And that's the beginning of the empire. But at this point, we are still talking about the fact that he's, you know, he's trying to establish himself in this area in the Timurud Empire uh, and in and around Samarkand, Bukhara, Herat, Kabul. Uh, Kabul is really his base town. He's tried to make Samarkand his home. He has not succeeded eminently in doing so. Um, what is going to happen, and this is a very interesting episode uh, in the life of Babur, is that the Safavid dynasty, the Safavid dynasty was a ruling dynasty in Iran, in Persia, all right? Uh, the leader of that dynasty, and you know, Iran is a country that is predominantly Shia, not Sunni, okay? So he says to, he, Babur, uh, uh, he offers Babur his help, all right, to, to, become the predominant ruler in Samarkand, because as I've mentioned to you, Babur has kind of tried to retain it. He loses control, partly because he has competition from other people in the family, partially because he has competition from other powerful warlords in that area, all right? So he says, I'll give you my help on the condition that you convert to the Shia sect of Islam. Babur is already a Muslim, but he's a Sunni Muslim. And, and, and the Shah Ismail says, you convert to you become a Shia. You display the external science of being a Shia. You dress like a Shia. The Shia dress is a little bit different. And uh, you, if you agree, you have to read the Qutbah in my name. The Qutbah is the Friday prayer because in, for Muslims, the Friday prayer, the, the worship on a Friday, on the Jummah, is the most important worship on in the week on the Friday. And the Friday prayer is known as the Qutbah. So when you read that, he says, you have to read it in my name because for him, for Babur to read it in Shah Ismail's name is to accept Shah Ismail's sovereignty, accept that yes, I owe my allegiance to you. You are the greater person, okay? And, and Shah Ismail says, if you do that, I will give you Samarkand. I will ensure that you can stay there. So Babur agrees to this compromise. Unfortunately, things don't work out for him well. Why? Within eight months, he loses it to the Uzbeks, right? Uzbekistan, remember, further north, right? Why does he lose it to the Uzbeks? Because when he shows the outward signs of being a Shia, he basically has compromised himself before his own people. They begin to get suspicious of him because the Muslims in that area are predominantly Sunni, right? On the other hand, Shah Ismail begins to get a sense that this man is, is a fake. He's not really interested in converting at all, right? So what happens is that Baba, in a, in a sense, is caught between the two, and he's going to find that he doesn't have enough of the support either of the people or of Shah Ismail, and he's going to be basically evicted from Samarkand, right? The consequence of all of this is that Baba is eventually going to lose a, come to the conclusion that, look, maybe I should turn my gaze eastward, all right? maybe what I should really do is I should lay claim to Hindustan. And what's happening in Hindustan, of course, at this point in time is that the Lodi dynasty is really on its last legs. 
So the, partly because, and this is where we'll stop today because this is going to set up the entry for Babur coming into India, partly because of course, what you also have is you have a situation where the Rajput clans are extreme, extremely important and some and, and the Rajputs again have a tradition of being warriors. So there is a constant uh, problem that the Lodhis have. They don't have, the Lodhi is the last of the Delhi Sultanate dynasty. And in 1526 over here, if you look here, we'll revisit this in the next lecture. Um, and that's the battle. It's called the first battle of Panipat where the army of Sultan Ibrahim Lodi, all right? The, the ruler of the Lodi dynasty is going to lose on that battlefield, it's going to lose to Babur. And that is what's going to set up uh, the, what is going to become known as the Mughal Empire. Of course, at that point, it's not known as the Mughal Empire. The word Mughal, by the way, is, is really the same word as the Mongol. That's, you know, um, a different, I mean, different form of that word. Oh, it means, oh, it's the same as Mongol. Yeah, yeah. basically it's the same word. Yeah, I mean, it's the same, Mughal means Mongols. So, you know, but, but as I said, these people are, so, you know, they're, they're, it's, they're, they're, it's Turkish, Central Asian ancestry, but they are, but the, but, but the Persian influence is very strong. We have seen that, uh, you know, uh, over a period of time, uh, the official language will actually be, um, of the Mughal administration will be Persian uh, because Turkey was not uh, understood, uh, which was Babur's own language and the language of his um, uh, uh, ancestors was not understood widely, right? Uh, so, but we will get into that history today. So the gist of the matter is that he is, Babur is going to, is going to turn his gaze further east and decide that he's going to try to see if he can make a claim to Hindustan, which is what he's going to do. So, so this is, this is the last, so Kabul is where he's been based. He's been trying to set him, himself up in Samarkand over here, right? Not been very successful, uh, has tried to set himself up in Herat, um, not very successful over here either. Too many details if one, one had to, you know, go over exactly what happened. Um, and so what he does is he decides to set his gaze east to Hindustan. Of course, to get to Hindustan and to get to Delhi, to get to Delhi in particular, he first has to cross over into what is now Pakistan, right? And then he has to come all the way into Punjab over here before he can get into, so if you look over here, the long ways that we're really talking about, right? How he did that and what happened subsequently, is what we'll have to take up later on. Okay. Very interesting. Got yeah. it. And the, the, there was one point on a slide, like how he dealt with his enemies was something that was used throughout the Mughal Empire. Yeah. So, 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 so that is something that we'll have to, it is really properly looked at um, later on, if I may put it this way. Um, because um, you see the fundamental, the fundamental uh, argument that I'm going to make uh, uh, with regards to that point only, with regards to that point is that one of the, the things that Babur set forth as a principle, and I think that was one reason why the Mughal Empire was an empire that extended over such a large uh, portion of Indian territory, why it became perhaps the preeminent empire in the world of why it generated such an enormous uh, amount of art and architecture. I mean, just look at North India. Uh, I mean, at least of what's surviving today, uh, you know, you go to Agra, it's the Agra Fort, it's the Taj Mahal, it's the Itmadu Dola, you go to Delhi, it's the Jama Masjid, it's the Red Fort. Um, <coughs> Uh, you know, the same legacy in, um, in, in Lahore. Uh, you know, architecture on this grand scale, the gardens that were laid out, um, all of this was possible 
of course, it's a complex history because then you'd have to look at the history of uh, revenues, how revenue was exacted from people. Okay, where did they get the revenue for all of this? Did they have to tax people very heavily? Did that create resentment? Nonetheless, what we're saying is that the Mughal Empire, 1526 till at least the mid 1700s, officially, of course, it ends only in 1857 officially, but at least the mid 1700s, you know, roughly about 225, 250 years. Um, uh, and for certainly about, let's say 150 years, it's it's really in many ways a glory of that part of the world. Uh, so the answer to your question here is what you were asking is that one principle Barber learned was that there has to be a way to deal with the enemy. And the best way to deal with the enemy is not barbaric savage behavior, but rather to try to incorporate the enemy. Treat the people you've defeated well. Absorb them into your empire if you can. Even absorb them into your own administration. Right? Uh, the Mughals did that. Babur is the one who laid the grounds for it. Of course, the empire is going to expand, and particularly during the period of Akbar and for the next three emperors after him. So M Akbar, Jahangir, Shah Jahan, Aurangzeb. Uh, there you're talking about, you know, a rule extending over 140 some odd years, something like that, but among the four of them. There you see that principle taken very seriously. Of, which is not to say that there were not times when, such as when the Sikh gurus were martyred, right? Yeah. But... Uh, the way in which they absorbed the Raj, Rajput uh, rulers um, whom they had defeated and uh, the ways in which the Mughal emperors were attentive to different religions and, and all of that, these are questions that will come up later on. There's, by the way, a very commercial Hindi film, very well made, I must say, um, from comparatively recent times, and I say comparatively recent, it's about 15, 20 years old, I think, that you might want to see. And there's a much older film that you might want to see before the next lecture, if you get time, if you have a few hours to spare. You know how these these kinds of Hindi films, I mean, it's like half a day. You know, they're three and a half hour, four hours long. I mean, uh, but there's this film called Jodha Akbar. Um, uh, it's about three hours, 40 minutes, made about 15, 17 years ago very colorful. Uh, you can, you know, if you can find a nice print online or get a DVD, uh, I, I would watch it. The older film I would watch is Mughle Azam, one of the most famous commercial Hindi films ever made. Okay, Mughle Azam, um, and um, um, it goes back to about 60, 60 odd years. Watch at least one of the two if you can. Got it.